So, ladies and gentlemen, um, honorable uh, PSK members and our guest uh, participants. Um, my name is uh, Dr. Daniela Munene. I'm the CEO of the Pharmaceutical Society of Kenya and your host for this morning's uh, webinar. This is our second webinar in a series of pharmacy COVID-19 dialogues where we're talking about what pharmacists are doing to respond to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. We, 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 we have members um, who are practicing in, in various areas, in, in, in hospitals, in community pharmacies, uh, in, um, in other settings, even in the policy space. And um, the scope of the pharmacist is so wide that we want to bring to you uh, you know, we want to highlight what pharmacists are doing to combat this pandemic uh, so that we share the knowledge and we implement in our own areas of practice. We also want it to be interactive where participants can ask questions and learn from the experts. And so thank you so much for joining us um, this morning. I would like to introduce to you the moderators who will take us through the program today. So our first moderator, if I can have the next slide, is Dr. Michael Mungoma. He's a member of the Pharmaceutical Society of Kenya. He's the Dean School of Pharmacy at Mount Kenya University. And he's the member of the PSK National Executive Committee, as well as being a member of the PSK COVID-19 Response Task Force. Karibu, Dr. Mike Mungoma, please say hello. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming to this webinar. Thank you, Mike. Our second uh, moderator is Dr. Sylvia Opanga. She's a member of the Pharmaceutical Society of Kenya. She's a senior lecturer at the School of Pharmacy, uh, University of Nairobi. And she's the chair of the Education and Public Health Committee of the PSK COVID-19 Response Task Force. Karibu sana, Dr. Opanga, please say hello. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming uh, to the webinar and we expect an exciting day. Thank you. So over to you moderators to take us through the program. Um, so this is Dr. Opanga and I'm going to start. Um, Again, I welcome you to this webinar. And as you know, pharmacists have been um, considered not so at the forefront. But one thing that I always say, if you're not invited to the table, please create your own table. So here we are, creating our own table, running our own webinars, and impacting Kenya. So Karibuni Sana. I'll start with a few ground rules and announcements. Um, so all of the participants are muted during the entire course of the webinar. If you need to ask the question, please use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your window. Questions shall then be addressed by panelists later in the program. For PSK members, if not already done so, please subscribe on the TPD portal for today's webinar so that you can get your TPD points. And please note, this is a point of emphasis the CPDs will be awarded to paid up PSK members only. This webinar is being recorded and the audio will be made available on PSK's YouTube page. Next slide. So I'd like to introduce our speakers. Um, our first speaker of the morning is Dr. Caroline Nasambu Wafula Esiaba. She's a clinical pharmacist who has specialized in pediatrics and oncology a graduate of the University of Nairobi program. She practices at Jaramogi Oginga Odinga Teaching and Referral Hospital. She graduated from the University of Nairobi with her Bachelor of Pharmacy degree and Master of Pharmacy degree in clinical pharmacy, specializing in pediatrics and oncology. She also has an MBA with a strategic leadership option. She's currently a member of the National Bioethics Committee of NACOSTI 
a member of JOTRH Institutional Ethics Review Committee, the Director of Research and Training at JOTRH, Head Consultant Clinical Pharmacy Services at JOTRH, and Honorary Lecturer of Clinical Pharmacology and Clinical Toxicology at Maseno and Uzima University of Kenya. Karibu sana, Caroline. Our next speaker is Dr. Neto Obala. Again, he graduated with a BPharm from the University of Nairobi. He works as a pharmacist at the Chulaimbo Hospital in Kisumu County. Um, he then later on went to become a sub-county pharmacist before joining the Jaramogi Oginga Odinga Teaching and Referral Hospital in Kisumu as a clinical pharmacy, and he has specialized in internal medicine. Um, he is a member of the COVID response screening, um, COVID response team, and he's the screening team leader at JOTRH. Welcome, Dr. Neto. So I will hand over, I'll hand over to our speakers, but the program is, um, Caroline will start by talking about the pharmacies at the front line between the COVID-19 pandemic, and then Dr. Neto will follow. If you have any questions, please keep them coming to the Q&A uh, chat, and we'll have the questions at the end of the session. So I'd like to hand over the session to Dr. Caroline Wasula to continue. Thank you. Uh, thank you, my mentor. Uh, just as I've been introduced, I'm Dr. Caroline Nasambo Wafula, Esiaba. Uh, I'm a clinical pharmacist at George TRH. I'm going to present on pharmacists at the front line beating the COVID-19 pandemic. So just as we go on, uh, just as our mentor has said, it is always good to pick your space and run away with it. So um, the introduction, the pharmacy staff are generally considered as medium exposure risk for COVID-19, and that is according to the State Occupation Safety and Health Administration 2020. So you'll ask yourself why. This is because as we keep on dispensing and getting closer to our patients, we are frequently in close contact with them uh, at uh, within six feet or 1.8 meters. And sometimes it can even be less. And this then makes, uh, makes us uh, to be exposed or, or to be mediumly exposed as stated in the introduction. So pharmacists and COVID-19, so pharmacists are the first, sorry. Uh, sorry, I think there's a problem with the person on the slides. There's a problem on, on your side. Hello? Hello, Daktari. Is the uh, Peter? Are you are you having a challenge changing the slides? No, actually, I'm okay. Sorry. It's Is been that running. Correct, it's been running down the slides. <laughs> okay. okay. Probably I can start once again. Uh, we, are, as you said, pharmacy are considered the medium exposure risk for COVID-19, as stated by the. United States Occupation Safety and Health Administration 2020. And the reason for this is uh, it's because of our frequent and clo close contact with the, our clients as we see them. And this makes us to be more at risk uh, to be infected with the SARS-CoV-19 COVID as uh, we have seen. And currently as a, a county, we have cases and this probably to us, it makes us to be more cautious, even as we manage our clients. Yes, next. So through the public preventive measures advocated by the World Health Organizations, we as pharmacists are working together alongside with other healthcare workers. And you'll ask yourself why the goal is for us to flatten the curve. Uh, as a country, we realize that we, are, uh, we have had an upsurge recently 
but as we go along, we are praying that uh, this will, we will actually flatten this curve so that we can be able to open the economy. The chart there shows uh, the time since the first case in the country and the number of cases that have seen been uh, encountered uh, within this country. And as you can see, we are actually headed towards that. The flatter curve assumes the same number of people get infected, but over a long period of time, or uh, a less stressed health system, potentially less deaths. So with time, there'll be a less stressed uh, health system, and consequently, then we will have less deaths as, we, as the curve flattens out. And that is our prayer as a country. So uh, generally, we all know that uh, pharmacists and pharmacies are the first point of contact. Anyone who has a headache, anyone who has a stomachache, their first point of contact will either to rush to a pharmacy. And for us who are working in the public health sector, uh, the, the, the first point for them to come will be the pharmacy. And that at times usually acts as a point of reference uh, so that we refer them to the other to the outpatient or inpatient or casualty based on the, on the issue that arises. So for this reason then, there's need for the pharmacy practice to remain uh, open uh, throughout 24 seven so that you are able to manage and curb uh, the public health needs that arise. So with this then, what is the general role of uh, hospital pharmacists in COVID-19? We still remain the frontline uh, public uh, frontline workers, as we directly serve the patients, both inpatient and outpatient. And our main role as pharmacists, we know, is dispensing. So as we dispense, as we do medication uh, use counseling, as we do bedside patient care and support, we as pharmacists, we are actually providing the the, the, the frontline uh, health service for patients. We equally. Um, as pharmacists are part of the hospital management team. And basically we play a, a key role in decision-making in the hospital. And uh, here with me is Dr. Neto. He's actually our lead person in the screening team. And uh, uh, he's running away with that idea, guiding and leading the hospital very well through all this. And we equally participate in various hospital committees. Uh, like the institutional ethical review committees and the training committees to be able to spearhead the training of COVID-19 and surveillance uh, exercises that are ongoing. We equally offer are offering specialized uh, services. We have our, our uh, pharma pharmacology, a clinical pharmacologist who is uh, currently, as we are here, uh, at the oncology clinic spearheading. Uh, the oncology services during this era of COVID-19. And equally, we are offering uh, consultation across board the hospitals. We equally participating richly in research, as I will discuss later in the, in, the, in the later slides. So as we can see, our role as pharmacists is broad, and we need to actually um, position ourselves so, so that even during this time, we are not left out. So the scope of activities that uh, pharmacists can do uh, during the COVID era, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, we have first triage and screening services, which as I've clearly stated in our hospital, the head of this is Dr. Neto, who is uh, leading the team well. We are also working along with him, heading the different uh, groups uh, in the triaging and screening services. We equally participating in uh, ward rounds. The ward rounds we are doing here, uh, we not because we are only two clinical pharmacists. We are doing it through Zoom, so that we are able to advise in the team group as we go along. So we also participate in in and outpatient pharmaceutical care, where we offer dispensing, medication reconciliation. So in COVID time, as we dispense, what we have decided as a hospital. We have prepacked medications that are prepacked and they're actually taken to the COVID area. We have a quota. With that, then we discuss uh, the management through Zoom so that uh, the nurse at the isolation area can then uh, administer the medications as directed by the clinical pharmacists. 
We also offer medication reconciliations in pandemics for patients who come on board and they were on medications that uh, probably they, they had not started using or they, they were using. So once they are discharged, we reconcile the medication so that one, if one is hypertensive or diabetic, they continue being on the medications as we continue offering the medication use counseling and equally referring the clients to the various clinics that they're meant to, to be in. Then we equally promote disease prevention. And how do we do this? We are active members of the infection prevention control. I previously have been the infection prevention control chair. And uh, together with this, we are equally working at, alongside with the antimicrobial uh, resistance committee, which I'm equally a member, uh, to actually promote disease prevention. We all know that prevention is better than cure. Then as pharmacists, of course, one of our heroes, pharmacovigilance, and monitoring and treatment outline. So for all the medications that we, we, we give, we have to be vigilant so that uh, we are able to look at the pharmaceutical care plan and the outcome of these medications as we manage our patients. So we have also gone along. We have also gone along to training of pharmacy pharmacy staff alongside other healthcare workers. So like currently the training that is ongoing is psychosocial, uh, psychosocial training that is going along. And we are hoping that this will take us a long way as we go on with this. We equally participate in research as Dr. Neto is leading the triaging and screening services, is equally in charge of the surveillance team where data is collected. And that actually informs the hospital on the way forward. Then, as I equally said, we also actively participate in infection prevention uh, uh, and antimicrobial resistance committees, as well as uh, the medication. Uh, we are also part of the medicines therapeutic committee. So I'll talk. Uh, I've already talked about this, but I'll quickly run through this. Uh, triage and screening, Dr. Neto will cover in depth on this. Yeah, but uh, currently what uh, we are doing is triaging services and early recognition through screening has emerged as a, a supportive modality. And pharmacies, as we have clearly said, work alongside other healthcare workers to ensure that this is done. And as I've said, Dr. Neto, uh, is working, is the team lead of this. And uh, we have Dr. Emma Bosire and myself working together with him, uh, leading the triage and screening services. We equally are doing commodity management. And what is the goal of this? Is to ensure prevention and disease control of COVID-19. Uh, we have pharmacies we should guarantee. We know that as pharmacists, we should uh, uh, guarantee a vicious uh, supply of medication so that at no point should we run out of uh, the medication. So as a joint TRH, we from inception have come up with uh, uh, a strategy on how to do this, buy medications, mainly from Kemsant, from our local suppliers to ensure that these medications are equally available. And this we did by complying to the commodity management cycle, as I'll dis discuss it in the next slide. So during the pandemic, pharmacies should prioritize the dispensing of med medicines and medical devices over non-essential products. And this is actually in line with the policy that the Minister of Health had released where we had the special clinics that had been closed. We thank God that now they have been opened. And this was in respect to now provision of uh, essential medications to the, the people who are affected by COVID and those people who also come in uh, critically ill. So to ensure this, as a committee, we set up uh, and had our commodity, ensure that uh, the commodity management circle is complied to where we had to do our, we had to select the medications that will be key during this era and how they'll be procured and distributed within the hospital. 
And uh, for this, we have uh, one of our team pharmacy leaders, uh, headed by Dr. Emma, uh, and uh, deputized by Dr. Eric. And they're doing it uh, so well so that all these particular drugs are able to be availed in the hospitals. So we also, uh, for this, because of COVID-19, the entry to pharmacy is mainly limited to the pharmaceutical staffs. And for the supplies, before they, they enter into the stores, they have to be cleaned and dis disinfected before entry. So equally have uh, weekly updates on the medications that are available. And how do we do this? We usually have provide an e-list to the facility through our various uh, portals. We have water, or the, the George TRH community WhatsApp. We have the George TRH uh, consultants uh, uh, WhatsApp group. We equally have um, the hospital management team WhatsApp group. And most importantly, we equally have our hospital medicines therapeutic committee who equally advises the hospital on what medications to use. So this is usually done. And we do not forget that during COVID era, we also provide the availability leads, at least to the isolation era. And emergency, we also provide the emergency uh, drugs. So these particular drugs in the isolation era, uh, area, we are pre prepared and the emergency medications are veiled. And as I said, we have a porter who does the transportation of the medications. So who acts as a link between the pharmacy and the isolation area. Yeah, so that is all about uh, commodity management. So I mentioned that as pharmacists, we are equally taking a key role uh, in COVID-19 training. This picture was not able to clearly capture Dr. Neto. Dr. Neto is the one seated there, just in front of uh, the guy in pink, who was doing the introduction, epidemiology of COVID-19 training at our site. And even today, he's been doing it. So, so that now we educate the George Tiaret staff to ensure that uh, every staff is well uh, equipped with the knowledge to be able to manage uh, this particular training. And the way these particular trainings have been done, we have been doing it them on, on site. Uh, you can see on site we have uh, around 30 people seated, uh, observing one meter social distance. And online, we, we equally uh, were able to train. And we trained over 600 people at this particular time that we were trained countrywide. And this has taken us a long way. As we do this, in the afternoons, we have been offering simulation trainings where now the critical cases uh, are actually taken to the SIM center where they are, they, we demonstrate practically on the mannequins, high fidelity mannequins on what happens to the, if you have a COVID case. So the COVID case is actually, the, the, the mannequin is, um, trained on how to behave like a, a person, a real COVID case. So they present, and now the participants are able to, to manage the case as it presents. Yeah, so basically that is uh, what has been ha happening. And to motivate the people who have been part of the training, we have been providing certificates and CPD points for the accredited professions. So the guideline development, we have equally participated in a guideline uh, development, and this has helped uh, the hospital to go a long way, right from inception. The first uh, uh, guidelines that we participated in was the screening and charging guidelines that were actively led by Dr. Neto. He equally has also participated in uh, making the home-based care guidelines that has been uh, his brainchild. Of course, as we do this, it has, uh, we have had to adapt from countries that have already developed and have equally borrowed heavily from the national guidelines so that uh, whatever we have, we customize it, we customize them to suit the George TRH scenario. We have gone ahead and also um, uh, developed guidelines on IPC and antimicrobial guidelines in line with the COVID-19 pandemic. And this, we must um, thank MTAPS that came in quickly 
and was able um, to, to help us have a few of the guidelines that they have uh, developed by Dr. Ndinga. We appreciate uh, the work that you put in, Dr. Kusu. So we, we adapted that and actually customized them to fit uh, our situation. We went ahead as a facility also, where Dr. Kelly and myself are able to develop the N95, the youth strategy, by use of UV light. So we have gone ahead and actually actualized this. We have the UV light. Uh, that was particularly used at the facility. We equally doing donning and doffing and hand hygiene, which are key curriculum of uh, the COVID-19 training. And uh, we have equally developed um, the treatment guidelines during the COVID-19. And these are actually live documents that we keep on changing uh, time and time again. I saw one that was released yesterday uh, for the current uh, guidelines that were that that the country has released, and probably also look at them and customize it, customize them to our scenario. Yeah. So next. So by and large, we have equally also participated in research during COVID nineteen, and how have we done that? We have encouraged research as a research institution as an institution that has been accredited by the National Commission for Science, Technology and Innovation. We have encouraged research surveillance while ensuring that uh, ethical principles and considerations are adhered to so that none of our patients, none of our clients, none of our staff is actually exploited. And we ensure that even the safety and privacy of the patient is all equally adhered to. We as pharmacists, we equally part of the hospital surveillance team and we are uh, active in this. And this, as I, I said earlier, is helping in inform informing the hospital on the way forward. So we as we also part of the George Terrace Institutional Ethics Committee. And this has ensured that uh, we have continued research within the hospital. And uh, during this time, uh, we have noted an upsurge of uh, research proposals from our neighboring facilities. As you all are aware, most universities had closed. So we have, ha we have had an upsurge of protocols. And because of our commitment, uh, 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 personally as a director of research and training, we have been able to spearhead this. And we've been able to also help uh, expedite some of the COVID-19 related uh, uh, protocols. And finally, we on research, we are also part of the National Bioethics Committee. I'm a member and we are actually currently finalizing uh, on a document that we are developing on research, ethics and emergencies and pandemics. And we have worked in collaboration with the universities and all other stakeholders, including the Pharmacy and Poison Board. Yes. So uh, what guidance do we have for the pharmacy teams at George Terrence? We have different uh, pharmacy teams in the facility located in different areas. We have the, the comprehensive care clinic pharmacy. We have uh, the outpatient inpatient pediatric pharmacy, intensive care unit pharmacy, uh, the gender-based violence pharmacy and MCH pharmacy. So we developed this so that it can be able to guide uh, our patients and our staff as we work along during this era. So there's a notice to the patients to customers where uh, the, of emphasis, uh, we need to disinfect your hands as you enter the department. You also need also to maintain the social distance, as we all know, between one to two uh, meters. And as you walk, uh, we, we are not supposed to walk outside the markets. So for us, we have benches which have been put there and we ensure that uh, the patients who come there do not stay there for more than the stipulated waiting time. So if you, we also have a sneeze policy where you also need to sneeze either in your, 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 your elbow curve or uh, you, you, you sneeze into a handkerchief 
Yes. Then we have also said no hand, uh, no shaking of hands as we enter pharmacy. Yes, and then we also need to prepare uh, the prescriptions in advance if they need to be refilled so that we don't do it as the patients come on board. So the second is uh, at the counter, then what happens? So when possible, uh, we need to, uh, uh, currently what happens at each counter, we have one staff at a point in time. And we have various, like at the outpatient, we have various points where now the social distance has to be ensured. It's only one employee that serves at a point in time and we, we avoid swap. So if you're working in the inpatient, you don't swap to go to the inpatient because they're actually located in the same places. So all pharmacy staff at the counter, I also, we encourage them to wear facial masks for additional protection of both uh, the staff and the public. Then they keep at the counter only essential objects or like the PC so that we don't have the place of a crowded to accumulate uh, infectious materials. Then continuous cleaning of the counters. We have the committed staff that are doing that to ensure that the, the pharmacy surfaces are all cleaned. Then we have uh, the alcohol-based uh, solution that we have. This one is provided by the hospital through cancer and is able to be supplied across board to all so where possible, we also encourage patients to order their medications through the pharmacy. Now this one for us, we are not doing it, but what we have been doing, uh, we, for patients that are on chronic medication use, we supply them medication for a duration, longer duration than normal, so that uh, uh, when they come on board uh, next time, then if they have issues as pharmacists, we refer them to the, uh, the, special, the, the specialized uh, area so that they can be looked into. Yes, so this will actually help uh, avoid overcrowding at the department. So this we have applied to the patients who are on, on antiretroviral drugs and it is helping to reduce the burden at those areas. Yes, next. So social distancing is key and we cannot overemphasize this. We have said that uh, a safe distance of at least one meter has to be observed as we attend to the patients. Then we have said as the number of patients come, it is one patient at a time as we serve them at uh, the various pharmacy counters. Then, um, for those that have uh, prescriptions, we have uh, the trays that uh, we put the prescriptions there. But as we handle every prescription, you have to sanitize your hands to avoid uh, contamination. If uh, probably the private sector, maybe they have gone paperless, but for us as a public sector, we are still using the prescriptions. But what we have uh, insisted on is to use on the alcohol-based hand drug to ensure that uh, we are kept safe. So when you feel that you're very dirty, we wash our hands so that uh, the consistency and cleanliness uh, keeps on. Then for patients as they queue, we tell them to maintain a safe distance of one meter to two meters all the way. So we equally advise patients and uh, clients to avoid uh, long stays in the pharmacy area, because as we all know that uh, if you stay in contact with a suspect for more than 30 minutes, then you might become a victim of COVID-19. We equally avoid visiting the pharmacy. If they, uh, we also avoid clients to avoid uh, visiting if they're elderly or have comorbidities. So this charging is actually done at the screening and charging area. So if we see a patient who is elderly and they can be seen at the screening and charging area, we have clinicians uh, who are there and uh, we organize for them so that they can quickly pick the medications and leave. So the long queues have been actually uh, reduced because of this. Yeah, so sometimes uh, just as that statement states, we equally request a family member, friend, or neighbor to pick 
to go pick the medications for the client as they wait uh, for them to leave the facility, especially if they're not critically ill. So the recommendations for pharmaceutical services and activities in pharmacy. So we have the point of care services. We have continued with our ward rounds in the critical areas. Uh, we have been having daily ward rounds, the ICU units, uh, and the medical ward rounds. The numbers we must admit have been low, not like uh, the usual uh, times when we don't have COVID. But we pray that with the opening of the, the clinics, uh, probably the, 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 we will have uh, the points of care will be will be having enough clientele. Yeah, so at the point of care, we are doing uh, clinical pharmacy reviews, both in the wards and outpatient, to ensure that uh, this is well done. And this is not only done by the clinical pharmacists, but it's done by all pharmacists pharmacy staff to ensure that uh, now uh, care continues so that no one is left out uh, during this time of COVID-19. So these services may need to be restricted or interrupted if they could represent a risk to the health uh, of the team. So why are we saying this? Because of COVID-19, we as pharmacists, we have uh, some of us who have comorbidities, some have diabetes, Mellitus, the immunocompromised diseases. So, if you are presenting with this kind of diseases, then as a healthcare provider, then you need to be involved with other duties other than now direct dispensing at uh, uh, direct dispensing to the patient. Equally, if you're expectant, you're exempted from now this particular duties so that uh, you don't become uh, easily. Uh, risk as a healthcare worker. So um, to ensure continuity of pharmacy activities, it's, we recommend that uh, it's important that we divide the pharmacy team in, in shifts. So for us, practically what we have, we have the day uh, pharmacists who work between eight and five. We have those who come work between uh, five and 8 p.m. and we have those that work at night and equally we have those that work in the CCC uh, oncology units. They're separate entities and we have those of us who work also in the world. So when we do this then, uh, after those, if you work long hours then you're given a break so that uh, you're able to, to rest, especially those who cover at night and to equally avoid uh, burnouts. Employees with diseases, as I've said, those who have immune conditions or those with chronic conditions, they're actually um, given back office tasks. And it's important that uh, now hand hygiene measures should always be reinforced at all times. So this employee, all employees should change coats more often, the dust coats that you're using it's important that uh, to ensure um, safety, you don't use the same dust coat from Monday to Friday. It's important that you keep on cleaning your dust, uh, dust coat uh, to ensure cleanliness. Then uh, we also discourage the wearing of accessories such as uh, bracelets, watches, and rings. Yeah, because this will act as a reservoir for infectious uh, conditions. Long hair or beards may reduce the efficacy of masks. So it's important that you hold your hair uh, in a manner that uh, you are able to, to effectively put on the masks. Yeah. Then whenever it is necessary to put on masks for Googles, hygiene and disinfection, disinfection of the hands should be performed before and after. And in regard to this, that is why as a facility, we have a curriculum for donning endorphin and this is an ongoing uh, curriculum that has been role, been taught across board online and on-site training to ensure that this gets through the, the staff the hospital staff the country at large so recommendations for outpatient care 
So the basic principles of infection prevention and control and standard precautions should be applied in all healthcare facilities, including outpatient care and primary care. Those are now the, the, low, the lower tier levels. So for COVID-19, the following measures should be adapted, triage and early recognition, uh, hand hygiene, respiratory hygiene, that is the, the cough etiquette, medical masks to be used by patients with respiratory symptoms, and probably a word on this, our hospital, there is a surveillance that is ongoing, and any patient who presents with uh, respiratory symptoms are actually triaged and taken to the to, the, to, to this particular uh, team that will be able to look through the patient, uh, clerk them and see and test them for COVID-19 in case they're suspects. Appropriate use of contact and droplet uh, precautions for all. We have posters across board in the hospital. Then prioritization of care of symptomatic patients has been key. And it has been a very key role of the triage and early recognition and as we said, we have clinicians at the triage area where they see and take care of any patient with symptomatic and proper referral is actually given. So when symptomatic patients are required to wait, they ensure, they ensure that uh, they have a separate waiting area. So at our screening area, we have a different waiting place where if one is suspected then, Dr. Neto, who is the lead, is uh, contacted to be able to get in contact with the surveillance team. So then uh, we also educate patients and families about our early recognition of symptoms, basic precautions to be used, uh, which, uh, which the healthcare facilities should also refer to. So for us, we have our, our own guidelines, but these ones we adapted from the WHO organization and the Kenyan guidelines. So um, last but not least, we have a joint TRH staff motivation. Uh, the pharmacy department uh, coined this idea for the joint TRH staff for staff. We realized that our staff were actually getting burnout, and therefore then we said, what can we do? And we agreed that as a staff, we have a contribution kitty, in which I was the treasurer to collect some money and uh, be able to motivate our staff. So what unique way to do it, it the amount of money that uh, we raised was just enough for a breakfast. So sometimes last week as our staff were coming in, all of them were served with a cup of tea, uh, samosas. Doctor, Dr. kindly, kindly summarize. Okay, we are finishing. Yes. So the outcome of this was uh, our staff were actually uh, very much motivated. So what is the parting shot for us? That as pharmacists, we should always remember the Hippocratic Oath. So that in all these things, we need to provide medications for all. We should not harm. And if you have any new medication or devices, they should be availed to all. And as I end, we are saying that uh, just as our new CS has kept on telling us that if we continue behaving normally, this disease will treat us abnormally. So for us as pharmacists, let us be that change agent that our profession requires us to be. As uh, our late uh, professor used to tell us that we need to be the change agents that we need to be. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Terry, for that very informative uh, presentation. I think there's quite a lot going on out there. <clears throat> and this forum is really bringing out the best of pharmacists. So without, uh, again, uh, much ado, I'm going to allow Dr. Neto Bala to make his presentation. Welcome, Dr. Neto. Okay, thank you very much. I hope I'm audible from your end. Okay. Yes, you're audible. You're audible. Go ahead. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Annette Obal, I'm a former host here at JOTRH. And uh, I think this was a, a very timely uh, presentation, at least for us to showcase what we are doing in JOTRH. And uh, I want to say thank you for uh, Dr. Opanga, my mentor back in school, and also Dr. Caroline Wafula, uh, my mentor here at the facility, uh, who actually had prepared the way for me, at least uh, when I came back from my studies. I found at least an environment where at least I can interact with the people uh, who appreciate the role of a pharmacist. And again, my presentation will be more of what can a pharmacist do uh, beyond uh, the pharmacy department. Yeah, on my outline, I'll be looking at the screen and triaging just briefly. Uh, as uh, talked about it. Then also uh, emergency care uh, for patients who present with a tract infection. Then uh, precautions to be taken by healthcare workers and patients. We also say something on isolation, uh, N95 mass sterilization, IPC measures, and home-based care. Now, what we have here is uh, an algorithm which uh, we actually developed uh, with the help of uh, uh, the COVID-19 emergency response team and the physicians. Now, of course, the case definition was a big, big challenge, of course, to define who is a suspect, who, uh, who is a probable case, uh, who is a contact, and of course, a confirmed case. Uh, these were the conversations which were being done continuously. Every now and then, I would find healthcare workers who are doing screening or having challenges, uh, you know, in defining uh, who uh, you know, these uh, cases uh, are. Now, uh, on the right side is an algorithm that uh, we actually developed uh, showing the flow uh, how do we handle the patients uh, who are, 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 who have contact with the probable or confirmed COVID-19 cases? Now, um, we also defined uh, the exposure, uh, that is low risk and high risk. Again, also, who is a low risk and high risk? And of course, just based on what is in the MOH guidelines, uh, we share this information and they're going to be handled differently. Again, also, those, the other uh, Kawasaki-like uh, uh, disease which emerged uh, following, uh, you know, COVID-19 uh, cases. Uh, that also we've given this information. Again, as information comes in, we share it out with the healthcare workers. Now, this algorithm just shows the flow. Uh, you see, uh, once we've screened our patients, uh, whether they are uh, based on their contact, uh, we classify them either if they are symptomatic or asymptomatic. Not those symptoms of COVID-19. So for the ones who are asymptomatic, we establish the level of exposure. That is whether it's low risk or high risk. The ones who are low risk will be uh, guided to, uh, uh, to the, uh, will be informed on how they are going to self-isolate their homes. And of course, again, I'll be going through the home-based care uh, because this is information that, that we normally give uh, to our clients. And again, also on what to do. The ones who are high risk, of course, we have our public quarantine facilities. We have our KMTC here and that has been very, very useful uh, to that effect. And again, what to be, do, to be done and tests to be done with them. Uh, we give these clients this information uh, through our screeners, so at least uh, it can minimize anxiety amongst them. The ones who are symptomatic, of course, uh, I'll be taking us through uh, an algorithm on how to manage uh, the ones who have uh, you know, critical uh, respiratory conditions. Now, well, testings are being done and contact tracing as well. So this algorithm that I normally use, I won't go deeper into it, but has been very, very useful. Uh, and uh, this is an area where the pharmacist we can actually uh, be part of. Next slide. Yes, uh, this is uh, uh, how do we manage patients who present at the casualty? and the various point of entry with the respiratory tract infection. Well, you know, with the COVID, uh, suspicion and healthcare workers are uh, having a lot of, uh, you know, anxiety, and of course, some of them fear. If somebody just present himself to the, uh, to the emergency department, he's having signs of COVID, uh, they are confused that they, they actually don't know what to do. And this is something which has really affected even uh, service delivery. And so as pharmacists, we actually partnered with the physicians to come up with this algorithm. Uh, of course, based on the SpO2 uh, respiratory rates and other uh, critical signs, 
that shows that these patients are not doing very well. So the triaging is being done at that level based on their response of oxygen, that is less than 94%. Yeah, and the rest are details on how to manage uh, these patients. And with this, actually, it gave the casualty department uh, staff uh, more confidence in handling such cases, because now there's a clearer direction on what to do next. Yeah, which is very, very important. Now, again, also as they're handling these cases, uh, of course, the, we are also taking them through the IPC, uh, PPE level of protection. Because again, also when you're managing a suspected cases, uh, there's a way in which we need to be done appropriately. And again, also at this level, at what point again do we take samples? Uh, well, it, was very, it, it, has been, it, it, it has actually even saved a number of lives. Eh? Because, uh, you know, once a patient has been suspected to be COVID, uh, so, uh, a healthcare doctor can easily assume uh, this patient, uh, of course, uh, without being, uh, without giving the routine care. Of course, this patient who, who need oxygen and the lights. Uh, next slide. Next slide. Thank you very much. Now, on healthcare workers and patient precaution, this is another area where pharmacists have taken part in, uh, just part of the bigger team in emergency response. Uh, in defining procedures uh, for primary and secondary screening, risk assessment, and referral of a suspected case. Now, for the healthcare workers at the various point of entries, how does screening, uh, how do we do the screening? Because uh, we have the primary screening and the secondary screening. Primary screening is what we do at the screening point, and secondary screening is what is done by the healthcare worker as they are doing the history taking. Now, this has been clearly defined. And again, also what to do next. Now for the patient placement, how do we handle our patients who are suspects? Who are suspects and of course, confirmed cases. Now isolation uh, precautions uh, are there. And of course, where we talk to our patients, we tell them how to handle themselves. Uh, you know, uh, cough etiquettes, uh, you know, the distance, keeping distance and the lights. And also, of course, identification of a separate room where a patient can be held as they are doing the test. Again, also we took part in identifying that room. Uh, again, also in the isolation unit, the way it was set up, we were involved from the beginning. And even currently, even as we are managing the four cases, we are still involved in the same. Now, patient movement within the facility, again, is another area that builds a lot of anxiety if there's no proper direction. How does a patient move from point A to B? If a patient needs radiological examination at chest, x ray scan, how do they move from the isolation uh, to, the, to, the, to, to the radiology department for them to get these examinations done? So, uh, of course, we took part in this, uh, you know, how the patient handled themselves, the use of masks, and of course, the, the involvement of porters. Now, referral of suspected cases, uh, uh, handling, that is, uh, you know, moving from a peripheral facility to a referral facility, uh, using the ambulance. That again also will take part in defining, uh, you know, how the drivers should handle themselves, their level of protection, you know, the PPE use. And again, even after uh, the referral, the patient has been delivered, how uh, the ambulance should be cleaned and the appropriate uh, disinfectant usage. Next slide. Now, I'll just say something brief on the isolation. Uh, this way, we're keeping our patients. Uh, well, linkage between the screening point and isolation before was a big challenge, uh, especially uh, the moment we have suspected a case at the screening. You know, this is that anxiety and nobody knows what to do. So there they are, they are saying, uh, you know, the team leader, you have to come and, you know, help us. But one thing I've realized is that uh, as, as pharmacists and again, as team leaders, we need to do is to lead the way. And the moment you lead the way, then the others become more comfortable. So of course, our, uh, you know, observing the various precautions, uh, you know, keeping distance. And again, also talking to the suspected clients is something which we have to show them how to do it. And uh, of course, with those suspected cases, it builds a lot of confidence uh, among the other healthcare workers. So this is something which we have taken part in. And uh, of course, moving forward, it has been a bit, uh, you know, smoother. Now, uh, working hand in hand with physicians, of course, uh, in uh, whenever there's an anxiety here and there, of course, people don't know what to do. And even after the patient has been delivered to the isolation, uh, the physicians, physicians have been actually quite of help, even as we work together. Now, medication availability, this one Dr. Uh, uh, Wafula has talked about, developing the medicine list, and of course, what's to be in the emergency tray, and uh, making sure that uh, they are up to date. 
uh, patient monitoring, uh, particularly in the critical care. Uh, the clinical pharmacists here come in and we are part of the list of the consultants who will be taking care of the critical cases. And uh, again, also in the isolation, as Dr. Profil has mentioned, uh, we will be doing, we've been doing the Zoom, uh, you know, Zoom uh, rounds, uh, especially during the handing over in the morning, whereby we have, uh, you know, a summary of the patients, how they are doing, and uh, in case probably there is an input here and there, and of course, as pharmacists, we have a chance, uh, of course, uh, to put in our input. Yes, next slide. Now, N95 uh, mass sterilization. Uh, well, this is something which uh, the facility came up with uh, through the emergency response team, where uh, I, myself, and Wafula, and as well as Dr. Kelly and Dr. Emma uh, work in. Uh, of course, we all know that there's that uh, you know acute shortage of uh, uh, PPEs, and that again uh, includes the N95 usage. You see, healthcare workers may insist of, on, on using an N95 every day, which is not sustainable. And so this led to uh, the uh, coming up with this committee, uh, led by Dr. Kelly, who is our uh, pharmacist at the administration, uh, at least to come up with a protocol for sterilization of the N95 masks. Uh, we, uh, they actually uh, were tasked with coming up with options. Uh, and looking, look, looking at the best way forward uh, uh, in, with regards to the sterilization of uh, uh, these masks. And uh, they settled on the use of UVC, uh, UVC, uh, UVC equipments. And right now as we speak, ICAP, which is our, our major partner at JOTRH, who actually even helped us in setting up uh, the isolation and of course the screening, have also bought for us uh, that chamber for doing uh, this sterilization. And we're very, very grateful to them. Now, uh, well, there have been challenges, of course, with regards to this method uh, in terms of acceptance uh, you know, amongst our uh, colleagues, uh, the medical officers, the nurses. There have been a lot of discussions going around if how effective it is, safety. Some even fear the UV light itself. You know, people can always easily go into Google and try to find more information if they have doubts. And of course, it, uh, we have been there at least to sort out this misunderstanding that has developed. And of course, even offer uh, a vivid uh, evidence to the same. Yes, otherwise, uh, yes, the next slide. Yes, IPC, IPC. Uh, this is an area which is key to uh, the pharmacy department and uh, Caro and myself are involved in the committee uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, working with the IPC committee within the facility. Uh, now for the IPC uh, main role, uh, it's to reduce the risk of spreading the uh, COVID-19 within the facility. And uh, of course, uh, things like hand washing uh, uh, facilities uh, have been distributed throughout the facility. Uh, of course, the use of PPEs, uh, the surgical mask distribution, and again, also uh, use of gloves, uh, gowns, and the likes. Let me say that uh, we've also, also taken part in resource mobilization. Just as uh, uh, Professor Demo had mentioned in the, the last uh, webinar session, that as pharmacists, we've been key. And I remember from time to time, we've had to write proposals through uh, the office of the CEO uh, to our various partners. And uh, of course, uh, ICAP and Red Cross have offered at this facility. And we are still, uh, of course, trying to reach out to other partners for the same. So this is an area where other pharmacists can venture in, uh, in terms of resource mobilization. Now, again, also back to, uh, you know, how to um, ensure that the IPC measures are uh, observed. Uh, keeping those clothes in the isolation, uh, respect to the etiquette, uh, visitor restriction, waste management. I think a question has been floated on how waste are being managed. Yes, we have taken part in uh, you know defining how uh, waste management uh, should be done through uh, the public health department. Yeah, and of course, there's a clearly written guideline uh, to that effect, because again, remember, uh, during this uh, COVID-19, uh, the level of waste generation is quite high, higher than even before, because of course of uh, the more precautions that we are taking. So with the higher generation of waste, again, also calls for tighter measures. Now, of course, uh, cleaning of surfaces uh, and disinfectants to be used, and uh, of course, within the isolation, how to handle uh, the utensils and the linens and the likes. Yes, next slide. 
Now I'll finish with the home-based care. Now home-based care uh, is a domain that is actually in the public health through the community strategy. And uh, our pharmacists are working in this facility and particularly at the screening point, we have taken part in defining or rather in coming up with this protocol, which we've heavily borrowed from the national guidelines. Let me say that initially during that time when COVID was coming in, there was a lot of anxiety, with people coming in from different countries, you know, from the US, from India, from China. And by then there were no clear guidelines huh, on what to do. But again, we, we quickly came up uh, with something at least that uh, would actually offer guidance uh, on what to do. Now, based on the MOH guideline, uh, the home-based care is mainly for those who have mild diseases. And again, let me say that if you look at countries like the US, we have, uh, uh, you know, bulging numbers, I mean, 1.5 million plus. And uh, you're wondering if it happens in our country, I mean, how would we handle that? But of course, these numbers will actually outstrip the capacity of our our facilities in the country, and of course, Kisumu County here will not be left out. And I remember, as Karo had, had, had presented the flattening of the curve, of course, we are trying to flatten the curve so at least uh, to the extent that the health, health facility can handle. But again, if we go beyond that, in the end, we'll be left with uh, no other option but to resort to the community level one through the community health volunteers uh, to be able to take care of mild cases uh, within the community, the ones who don't present with symptoms. And so this informed, uh, you know, sharing uh, these guidelines. And of course, you know, having a guideline is one thing, but applying it is another. So this way we've been coming in, uh, you know, in sharing information, engaging the public health. And I think remember, as I said earlier, leading the way is very, very important because people don't know what to do at some point. And they're looking at the leader. Uh, how do we go about it? People are asking questions. So with the same guideline, uh, the guidance actually has been stratified into three uh, before COVID outbreak occurs. Of course, we've had uh, some period of about two to three months before COVID. Uh, the first COVID case was recorded in, uh, in Kisumu. Uh, during the outbreak where we are at and after the outbreak, of course, taking care of, you know, post-COVID. Now, before, there's that, those plans that have, have been put in place uh, in terms of uh, uh, preparing the community, the household level. You know, you're trying to imagine when the village and there's a case there, how do they handle it? Yeah, how do they have conversations? So at least they can also accept. We are looking at what happened during HIV and AIDS uh, pandemic. And uh, there was a lot of issues, of course, with accepting people who have HIV AIDS. So just a similar strategy uh, is what have been explored through the, uh, uh, the, the county, uh, county HMT uh, in the various areas of the community. And uh, this has been actually quite useful, uh, you know, in, in, in spreading out the information. Now, of course, phone, phone contacts have been shared, and we have contacts that, that, that have been developed through the uh, Maseno University and the county government. Now that we are here and we're having the outbreak, we currently have four cases uh, within the facility. But the strategy is, uh, at the moment, any positive case will be managed here, but as the cases will be increasing, we'll be moving to moderate cases and the other case, mild cases will be handled in the other peripheral and sub-county facilities. But again, as we're moving again to having critical cases and if the numbers are increasing, then the TRH here will, will only be admitting uh, the critical cases so that now the mild and moderate are being handled at other peripheral facilities. And uh, this information is out there. And I see again also our pharmacies, we've taken part in making sure that uh, you know this information is out there. Now, after COVID, well, we've been seeing the social media. And again, I think, uh, KNH has been quite instrumental in sharing this information and, of course, having uh, patients uh, sharing their testimonies on what had happened. Uh, we've had a lot of stigmatization. And, uh, of course, at the community level, how do we prepare the community to receive patients who have uh, recovered from COVID? I mean, in their community, in their households. Uh, it's very, very important to, uh, you know, inform the community on what COVID is. And of course, once they know, they can easily even accept uh, the ones who have been healed uh, from COVID. Yes, so uh, let me say that a uh, pharmacist, even as I finish, uh, that uh, there are many endless opportunities outside there, not just within the pharmacy. And again, let me say that we've not neglected our work within. Uh, we still do our work rounds generally on Tuesdays and, uh, and Thursdays. And of course, the other days, uh, 
uh, within the medical world, uh, pediatric surgery, and even the ICU. Yes. Thank you so, so much. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Dr. Neto Bala, for that presentation. Um, <clears throat> we'll move straight on to the Q and A uh, session, uh, and I I really appreciate Dr. Neto for keeping time there and just keeping your presentation short and to the point. So the first question goes to Dr. Caroline Wafula. <clears throat> and this comes from Dr. James Ryungu. Thank you for the good presentation. Have you developed any guidelines for HPT's management? including waste disposal to address special needs for COVID-19. And he's also asking, what is the role of pharmacists at Jotuarich in ensuring uninterrupted availabilities of commodities for COVID-19 response and preparedness, including PPEs? Dr. Caroline? Okay. Yes, yeah, thank you. Uh, the first question is we have uh, developed guidelines on the health products and technologies. Yeah, for us, the guidelines that we have uh, is just uh, for uh, the guidelines on medications, the, med the, the medications that we use during emergencies in COVID-19. Uh, we haven't uh, yet developed uh, this guideline on the health products and technologies. So probably it's a good insightful uh, a question that we, we as pharmacists need to move forward to that. But as being part of uh, the National Bioethics Committee, I'm privy to this that uh, there are guidelines on ethical issues uh, on how uh, these particular products and technologies need to be done. The product... Uh, the, the guidelines are actually soon to be released. I think we are having a final meeting tomorrow on Friday, and soon they'll be taken to the uh, to, to the government for for signage, and we'll have them soon. Then the second question was uh, just remind me on the PPEs. The second question. the second question was. Um, what is the role of pharmacists at your institution in ensuring uninterrupted availability of commodities for COVID-19 response and preparedness, including PPEs? Oh, great. Uh, the, role, uh, the role of pharmacists in ensuring that we have a uh, vicious supply, uh, supply of the personal protective uh, gears we as frontliners, we have been party to, it's part of the commodity management cycle. And first and foremost, as pharmacists, we need to know what are our needs. So if we know what are our, our, our needs, uh, that is why I was able to take us through the various guidelines that have you saw towards the end of my, preparation, uh, my presentation. So we need to know what are our needs as pharmacy. If we have pharmacists, if we know what our needs are, then we'll be able as pharmacists to, to be part of the selection committee. So when the IPC team is uh, selecting the, the, the various PPEs that are needed for the different uh, uh, areas, then we as pharmacists then also know what our needs are. So we have seen that our masks are important. We have seen that we need to also be putting on the dust coats. So those are important. We have seen in certain cases that if you're handling uh, prescriptions time and time again, the question that we need to discuss, will we, need, uh, uh, we, will we need gloves or not? If we will need, then it becomes an important personal protective gear to protect us as we handle the various prescriptions. And equally, as we see, if you're dealing with uh, like us who work in the wards, we equally need uh, those PPEs for those particular areas. For pharmacists who work in the oncology unit, the need for that would be an N95. So as we can see, the role of a pharmacist to be a front line in the selection of the various PPEs, PPEs that will be needed in the various areas of work. 
Thank you. Thank you so much for that response. Uh, the next question is to Dr. Neto. This is from Dr. Ripu Wafula. Is there any scientific evidence in support of the reluctance for Kenya to embrace home-based isolation of patients suspected or confirmed to have been exposed or infected with COVID-19 and who present with no symptoms or only mild symptoms which do not require hospitalization as has been the case in Vietnam? Okay, uh, let me say that uh... It's not, an, it's not a reluctance as such, uh, but as I mentioned earlier, the strategy that uh, we are having, and particularly at, at the county government of Kisumu, uh, not that we have fewer numbers, but as the numbers increase, because again, you see, we want to limit uh, the spread of this inf infection, at least, at least the level that we can handle. But the strategy is, at the moment, if there are any cases, any positive cases, they are being managed in the facility. But as the numbers increase, depending on our capacity, we will now be releasing them to the other level of, of, of care. Like, for example, at the Jotia Red here, we are at level five. Then the moment now our numbers start increasing, we will be handling the moderate to severe cases. Then the mild cases will be handled by the other facilities like KCH and the likes, eh? and the sub-county facilities. But again, as we're moving on, the numbers increasing again further. And, and, and I'd even given Excuse me, a case of uh, you know the U.S. setting eh, where the numbers are really large, so it just depends on the strategy. So I believe we could be headed in that direction if the, as the numbers increase. So I can't say that the, uh, that that the the ministry has neglected it as such, and that's why the guidelines had been actually prepared much earlier. Because remember, in March they had they had, had actually projected that I think by around April 10th we'd we'll be having like 10,000 last cases but again that didn't happen happen so I, I think preparations are there there is something which we are eyeing and of course probably time will tell when we can start implementing it yes th that's very true i think with covid19 every day is a learning experience and we keep uh, developing new ways of uh, handling these disease another question to you from dr esther maina I understand you're still handling the hard copy prescriptions. Are there plans to have the hospital services digitized as these will minimize COVID-19 transmission? So I can answer that. Okay. Yes. Um, as I said in my presentation, this is a public facility. The hospital has started digitalizing the outpatient department but uh, we have been having issues with the, the, the type of, uh, the type of uh, uh, technology that was installed. So it keeps on breaking. So for this, for lack of uh, consistency then, we are forced to be using both the hard copies and soft copies, but basically inpatient we're using uh, the hard copy. So uh, we're hoping that in the near future, and uh, quote unquote, we, we hope that we will be there. Yeah, because that is more of administrative. Thank you. Thank there you. is an interesting question here. This is going to be directed to Dr. Neto. Mm -hmm. Are the KN95 masks washed prior to UV sterilization? What solution is used to wash? Can you guarantee the microbial fil filtration integrity of the washed mask to prevent inhalation of viral particles? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, well, let me say that uh, Georgia Red had developed uh, the N95 decontamination uh, protocol eh, to guide the healthcare workers in that regard. Now, in the protocol, it has been clearly uh, you know, stated on what to do. Now, we don't clean them. We don't clean them. We don't wash them. We don't use any form of uh, you know, chemical on them because studies actually have shown that it may reduce uh, the integrity of the filtration as has been asked. And of course, we actually, that committee that I talked about, led by Dr. Kelly, and 
our administrative pharmacies, uh, they actually showed us a number of evidences, uh, of course, uh, food from CDC and many other countries. So we settled on the end, uh, on the use of the UVC. Now for the UV, uh, before, of course, once the, the, the healthcare worker has adopted, uh, you know, the N95, there's a way in which they should be handled. If that packaging into envelopes, then they are taken to the place for the, for the contamination. Again, so there's the labeling, because everybody uh, probably who has been given the N95 mask must keep his. And of course, uh, there's a clear protocol on how to label them, even after removal, how to keep them, even the person coming to do the decontamination process, it's a way in which you have to handle it. And again, also repackage it back. And again, also within the UVC chamber, there's a clearly, uh, you know, outline protocol and step-by-step -step guideline on how to decontaminate them. So we don't watch them. Uh, we don't do anything that will interfere with the integrity uh, of uh, this and uh, right. Thank you. Thank you for that. I know masks are quite a controversial uh, aspect of COVID-19, and there's quite a lot of research still ongoing to really uh, bring out some of the questions, answer some of the questions that are being ma asked about the use of masks, the integrity in terms of the fitting, reusability, and so on, and the sort of materials that are best used for effective masks. That question was by David Karenye. So the next question by Lydia Mumani. I think either of you can answer this. How practical is the online ordering of medicines and delivering them, considering the heavy workload? Do you have enough personnel to do this? Who pays? Okay, let me say that uh, for the... Uh, from, the f from the isolation, uh, a number of issues actually had emerged uh, the, with regards to how medicines will be moved uh, from the pharmacy to the isolation area. And we've been having conversation over the same uh, in the last two weeks. And uh, we actually settled on uh, doing that online. Of course, the place has been wired and uh, we have internet there. And also, of course, the phone lines within the facility have been connected there. So if these drugs are, are, are needed, uh, the order is made, the pharmacy is informed, they are packaged, and uh, we have porters. Eh? We have porters, uh, the, 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 the ones who normally do uh, patient movement and medication movement. So we have porters who have been allocated to do that work, and they have been, of uh, course, employed by the facility. Okay. Yes, and again, let me just say that. So again, well. to, to you, Dr. Neto, okay. since home-based care, this is from Dr. Louis Machogu, since home-based care is a community health function, do you have a paragraph or a couple on telepharmacy in the community health guidelines? What is the role of pharmacies in this to avail care to the chronic or acute patients in need of care but don't want to visit hospitals or even identified COVID patients receiving care at their homes. So if you have, please share. I think okay. the question is, yeah, so do you have any guidelines there? Now, guidelines on telepharmacy, no, uh, that we have uh, developed. Uh, we Okay, with regard to medication, let me say that uh, through the community strategy, and we are working closely with the public health, uh, these are conversations that we've been having. How do we take care of patients probably who have chronic conditions, they're at home, and they have mild conditions? And of course, as we said earlier, we need to limit movement of these patients. Now, we have the CHBs, eh? and uh, just using the same strategy that, was, that, that has been used uh, you know, for TB management, and HIV, we are borrowing heavily from the same same strategy. So I remember when I was working in Kisumu West, we do, uh, and also again as a sub county pharmacist, we used to do a lot of community activity. We used to engage with the community, pathology, uh, focal pathogens, and mention workers. Uh, of course, with regards to uh, giving medication at the community level, and I think at that point that's where I got a lot of knowledge of how level one uh, operates. 
for the same same conversation we'll be having even here with our our uh, public health and surveillance team on the same. Now, when it comes to uh, answering this question that uh, Mashogu has asked about uh, telepharmacy in the community guidelines, I think this is something we can pick up and see how best uh, we can do it. Uh, now, the role of uh, pharmacists in availing, uh, let me see, a care to the chronic acute patients who need care but don't want to visit hospitals. Well, as I've said earlier, uh, just taking advantage of the structures in place and of course using the community strategy. And again, remember, talking to people in the community really makes things a bit easier. When HIV was a pandemic, it was a, really, it, it was a big issue, bring, uh, bring a lot of, uh, you know, uh, stigma uh, to the community, people who have been affected. Uh, you know, the only thing which actually saved the system was it was so expensive to keep these patients in the hospitals. They had to resort back to the community. And that's why we are saying that uh, moving forward, we should have, continue having discussions with the level one, with the public health, to see how best these patients can get their medication. And again, also, as Karo had alluded to earlier, I remember during the first month, or rather the first two weeks, three weeks, uh, of COVID being an, uh, announced in the country. Uh, and of course, a number of services were scaled down, including the specialized uh, clinic. Uh, at the pharmacy, we had to uh, come up with arrangements, rather way forward, how do we help patients who need receipts? And imagine a patient who requires anticoagulation care. When they go to the pharmacy, I mean, you see, you can't just refill such a prescription. Yeah, so that's where pharmacies will come in. So moving forward, I think this is a challenge which we'll pick up and see what we do. I think I'll also uh, give Carol to share in some input. Uh, just an input on the question uh, Dr. Shogo has asked. Yes. Uh, in the inception of uh, COVID-19, uh, we had a case for a patient who a suspected case where um, a patient, one of actually that was a healthcare worker who had traveled from Nairobi to here only to realize that uh, uh, the, 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 the healthcare worker was in contact with a suspected case. So what we did was actually, um, it was not telepharmacy per se, but uh, there was online communication. The patient was at home, being managed at home. And uh, how we ferried drugs from George Terrace to their home was linked with uh, the motorcyclists who would who actually went and dropped the medication at the gate. And then uh, from the gate, uh, the healthcare worker picked because at that point, the healthcare worker was alone in the home that she was staying in. But later, after seven days, uh, the case was uh, confirmed negative. Yeah, but that is how, that is only the practical case that we have managed uh, as George Tierich uh, at home. So, but uh, as we have said, it's a learning point for all of us that uh, we need to consider as cases. Thank you. This question is from uh, Dr. Riziki Mulimba. I think I'll, I'll, I'll direct it to Dr. Caroline. Recently, MOH released a HRH document which gave a pharmacist, clinical pharmacist to patient ratio of one to 50. As practicing practitioners, do you think the ratio is feasible? If not, what do you think is feasible based on your practice? Now, based on my practice, um, uh, this, this data that uh, has been released, I, uh, to me, I would say is new, to, uh, not new data. Uh, because then I think uh, in the early, in the late uh, 2000, uh, the, the prescription, uh, we, we have been told as pharmacists, the dispensing rate, uh, we need to dispense 50. At any one point at a time, we need to, respond, to dispense uh, to, 50, to 50 patients in a time. But how effective is that? What quality services will you be rendering to this patient? Uh, in a day where people are working in shifts, huh? that ratio will not be practicable because of the numbers that we have as pharmacists in the country. 
and therefore then um, if probably we were to train more pharmacists and ensure that this ratio is adhered to, then it will be feasible. But uh, basically, if you want to have one-to-one, uh, -one, we can probably adapt uh, the model that MTRH is having, where each uh, clinical pharmacist or pharmacist is allocated a farm, a farm that has a few clients, probably say 30 or 20, where you, you as a healthcare practitioner, you are able to have a one-on-one -on -one, um, care with the patient. But with the numbers that we currently have, it is not feasible. But in the strategic plan, yes. Yeah, that, is, that could be my answer. But anyone else can answer. Yeah. Thank, thank you, uh, Dr. Caroline. I know that uh, document and that ratio was also quite controversial, and I think uh, an amendment needs to be done. I'm reminded here that um, <clears throat> members can pay a minimum of a thousand shillings per month through PSK pay bill nine six eight four hundred for the account number is your registration number. And this is just to support some of the efforts that the COVID-19 task force is doing. <clears throat> we know that there's quite a lot that is needed by pharmacists out there and PSK being the umbrella body is facilitating quite a lot of, of, of these activities. Uh, just to remind you again that for your CPD points, go to the PPB portal and click today's event so that you can get your CPDs. You're all aware that uh, <clears throat> it has to be done within 24 hours. After that, it disappears. Now, I'm still getting questions. Maybe I'll just, uh, I'll just, I'll just take one. Um, Dr. Evans Mbuki is asking, how are you ensuring continuity of treatment of chronic care patients, e.g. MOPC, considering the declining clinic attendance in hospitals countrywide? Is it possible that patients are missing their drugs? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mbuki, for that question. Yes, this has been a concern uh, from the time, uh, you know, services were scaled down and even at our level here, because uh, the, main, the main aim here was to reduce the crowding. You see, patients are coming to services with so crowds. Uh, of course, uh, uh, infection prevention there becomes a bit difficult. Eh? So we decided just to collapse some of those uh, specialized clinics. Now, uh, in ensuring the continuity, let me say that I sit in the same committee where uh, the specialists are sitting, of course, in running the MOPC. And uh, I think two weeks ago, we had a similar meeting, two, three weeks ago, we had a similar meeting on how to reopen the, uh, the MOPC. And uh, of course, uh, within our facility, here, let me say that uh, the numbers have started increasing again, much as it had declined uh, countrywide. But I think last week, but one, the numbers again started rising. And right now we are seeing about between 1,200 to 1,500 clients walking in to receive uh, services uh, within the facility from the screening desk. Now, to answer our question, uh, Dr. Mbuki, uh, ensuring continuity of treatment. Well, we have decided to start with Fridays and we restrict the numbers uh, of people to be seen. Uh, the ones who are coming, uh, to be booked. Then, of course, the TCH, the way they have been booked, at least to be spaced out. Uh, so at least to see how that will run. That's the discussion we've been having, even though, again, we are, uh, uh, those numbers are being as outstripped. At the moment, the public realizes that uh, these services are back. Again, it's a challenge, but uh, we are seeing how, uh, you know, to cope with it. Now, is there a possibility that these patients are missing their drugs? Yes, we cannot deny that. There's a very, very high possibility. But again, the decision which we had come up with much earlier is that uh, uh, for the ones who have uh, prescriptions, uh, medicines, uh, they be reviewed by the clinicians who are there. And in fact, I have not mentioned this, but at the screening area, we have the screeners and, and also we also do triage in there. Then we also have a clinician desk there we have an ENT person 
we also have an eye person as well as a dentist at the screening desk. So at this point here, this is where all these things are, are, are being checked. So at that point, for those who need refills, uh, they can be checked. Uh, we have a clinical officer there, but again, for those who need further review, then they'll be referred for the, uh, uh, to, uh, to the specialists. And again, also as I mentioned, uh, mentioned earlier, there are those patients who might really have to be seen, uh, like the ones who are going through and uh, uh, the ones who are on anticoagulation therapy. Those ones uh, that are screening for pharmacists normally see them myself and Carol, as well as Dr. Emma. Sula. Thank you for that answer. I think the last one would be, this is from John Kanyi. Would you advise community pharmacies to have temperature checks for every client coming to the pharmacy? I think either one can answer that one. Yes, we will. Yeah, because that, that would be part of triaging. If banks are doing it, if supermarkets are doing it, I think uh, consequently then, we as healthcare workers, pharmacy healthcare workers in the community then, we, we should lead from the front. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, with these uh, participants, I want to appreciate your presence and really say thank you for attending this webinar. I want to thank uh, Dr. Daniela uh, for hosting us. Dr. Peter Odiambo has been very good with the slides, no hitches. And Dr. Silvio Panga, my, my co-moderator. And of course, our presenters today, Dr. Neto Obala and Dr. Caroline Ofula for doing <clears throat> a commendable job uh, at Jude TRH. I think um, with this kind of presentations, pharmacists can really showcase what exactly they're doing out there. And I also want to appreciate the pharmaceutical technologists who are also present here uh because you're part of the pharmacy workforce and um, just to say again look out for our next webinar we are going to be holding these webinars every week so next wednesday there will be another one with different speakers but this will be shared in due course so with that, I want to say goodbye to everyone and have a good day. Thank you.